this edition of the Half Life Show, we talk to Dr. Siddharth Mohan, a biophysicist and an expert in protein biochemistry. He is a friend of ours for many years and we often refer to him interchangeably as Sid and Sidmo throughout the episode. He is an excellent teacher who is able to break down even the most complex topics into what he calls despicable analogies. We talk about the fundamental building blocks of life, the wonders and secrets that Mother Nature won't reveal to us, and the implications of learning those secrets on the future of humanity. We discuss drug discovery and how the entire scientific community came together as one to develop and deliver the COVID-19 vaccine to the world. Throughout the conversation, you will hear in his voice the excitement, respect and wonder he has for science and nature. Through his lens, Subo and I developed a deeper appreciation for the world around us and we hope you will feel the same through this episode. We talk about his personal journey, his inspirations and influences, which got him to where he is today. Siddharth is an excellent heavy metal drummer, even though he trained as a classical pianist, and the co-founder of What's the Scene India, which showcases and promotes the live music scene in India and has a dozen editorial teams in various cities all over India. Now, on to the episode. The whole reason we got started about all these things of what you do, Sid, as, you know, biophysicist that you are, is when you visited San Diego and you came down for the American Chemical Society Conference. That's right. When you stopped by my place, this is what we did, right? We put up a campfire in the backyard and then poured ourselves a couple of whiskeys and got started on talking about biology and physics and all that stuff. So basically, what we're trying to do is recreate that environment, right? And get you yeah. to say some of those cool things we spoke about. Because Subu over here was not privy to that awesome conversation. So that's uh, why we definitely have to get you on the podcast and now get you to explain those cool things you told me. And probably more. No, no pressure. Yeah. And so while I aim to please, let it be known that most sequels fail. And so that is the disclaimer I'm definitely putting up front before we sort of dive into it. And the one one thing I do want to say is it really helps. I think I, I, I TA'd a lot. I was a teaching assistant in graduate school for, for many years. And you, to explain a lot of concepts, I found myself clutching at straws with explaining things in, a, in an academic way, which is taking the same scientific principle and just sort of rehashing it. So I, I started boiling things down to terrible, absolutely despicable analogies. But for some reason, they would, they would often work. And one of the things that, that I explain is this, this idea of this Leventhal's paradox, which I know you guys have asked me about before. And, and the analogy actually is not sort of unique to me. It is, it is derived from conversations in the field of protein folding and protein science, where these, these chains of proteins are sort of compared to uh, beads on a string. And so the idea of a, a sort of a, a long sort of string that has uh, and inherently, you know, you can think of it as a as a two-dimensional entity. It's, it's just a bunch of characters uh, on a screen. Uh, actually, has a three-dimensional implication, and so that that field of protein folding is is kind of at the core of, of what I do as a, as a scientist, and and what what fascinated me and sort of got me into the field in the first place. We've all heard of proteins, right? What is the importance of proteins and why is the synthesis of proteins so important to the functioning of the human body or any you biological mean, system, for example? Especially because you have a lot of bros, right? I mean, especially, say, in office, in the gym, who are smacking themselves with, a, <laughs> with two or three whey protein shakes a day. And, you know, there's this very big, you know, there's, there's, there's a big call out for increasing protein especially in indian diets you know because it's not our, our current diets is not good enough and so on right so yeah it's a, that's a good question let's start there okay why do we why do we need protein what's it why do we need body? protein oh my god that's a that's a that's a, a jacked question to take your protein analogy as far protein. As, as you want yeah. to yeah protein <laughs> but, shake but simply said they are the biomolecular basis of life. It is a. It sounds like a very sort of grandstand, grandstanding type of statement, but it is fundamentally true. 
you are alive and breathing and you're able to sit here and hear and see and smell and and taste since we're enjoying some nice beverages because of proteins they are the sort of biological uh, molecules that that perform and execute pretty much all all of life's functions right they break down the sugar they they help you flex your arm they are the fundamental biological uh, uh basis of life they mediate all life and all functions awesome so it can make an organism function better the lack of proteins can kill and exactly. you know misformed proteins can affect the functioning of various functions of the body things like that so you know for all things to be okay all of these proteins and these little molecules have to fold and and look a certain way and kind of behave in a certain way if they have to chow down on a sugar or break down fat or whatever it is right there's this a lot of lot of functions and and exactly you hit upon the converse which is that if they are not folded correctly and folding is a very important word we will get to that in a, in a bit then things can go astray and so disease is born out of that there's issues health issues and that kind of segues into i think what you were saying subu that you know why why is protein necessary for health and why is it necessary for building muscle right so there's i i don't obviously know exactly the the mechanisms of how they are broken down and consumed but in general the idea is that your muscles are made of these these cells that contain uh, a, a particular protein called myosin and that is really responsible for the compression of the muscle and the tissue and the, and that's what causes movement and so the more of that you have the the stronger you are the the faster you are etc cetera, etc cetera. and so being able to really consume protein and and break it down and really metabolize it and force the body to take up that protein that you have consumed from outside means you can put on muscle you can you can gain muscle mass so to speak so you you mentioned protein folding a couple of times right and i i hear this a lot in our other med- medicine related podcasts and stuff and any time someone says protein folding this picture of like a thin sheet of paper like mm-hmm. pa- paper folding that's the image that comes to my mind i mean am i in the ballpark or do i have it completely wrong in my head does Maybe it look one extra dimension added mm-hmm. to it yeah. yeah you're in the ballpark but it's in a different plane i would reduce that simplify it to beads on a string so beads instead of a, a paper that's yeah. being crumpled right. think of it as a very long chain of these beads and and i'll dive into that analogy right away right so there yeah. are 20 basic amino acids they are the fundamental amino acids and the building blocks of proteins so if you want to t- talk about these in terms of the analogy there's 20 different colored beads let's say okay and uh, those beads all have unique properties as a result of their little colors and uh, so you know you can attach the beads uh, end on end and you can make a chain that's as long as you want and in any sequence of colors as you want right so if you think about that from a just a mathematical standpoint there's huge there's a huge space there's a huge coordinate space in which the sequence of these things can exist and and the 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 the, the shapes that you can crumple this string of beads into it's gigantic right there's virtually limitless numbers of conformations if you want to call it that so protein folding specifically deals with this field at the at the molecular level mm. uh, and why is that relevant right so okay so it deals with it but why is it relevant right it's um so i i said that okay proteins form the the basis of all life they mediate all these functions so you know pacman needs to be yellow and have a conical mouth to run around the track if he was any other color the you know dos would reject <laughs> reject the, the the game and that's exactly the the same thing with proteins if uh, you if you have a bead and it goes blue blue red red black yellow green yellow red and if you and you know that forms a chain that may be a, a, a crumpled little ball of yarn that that looks a certain way and that can chew down on a sugar let's say right now if you change that last bead to a to a purple suddenly the whole thing falls apart it happens now the question is why does it happen can i ask you one question right before that yeah 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 this analogy moves fast so please yeah are there any protein sequences that are purely a straight line or do they all have to fold and if they have to fold why do they actually fold so they have to fold so there is no real blanket rule nature nature has evolved so over over time proteins are as long and as 
folded as they need to be to do a function. Oh, okay. So it's driven by need, not just by, oh, you know, I have something that's 800,000 sequ- uh, amino acids long. Therefore, it is not folding. Like, that's not the way we think about it. So nature has evolved to say, oh, if I need three amino acids to do this function, I, I'll bet you money that there's something out there that doesn't. Now, mm-hmm. is there something... Probably not. You need a little more of a three-dimensional shape to do certain functions. That is, therefore, the prerequisite is that it has to be at least a few more amino acids long so that it can kind of fold and form a a, a relatively more interesting three-dimensional structure. Okay, that is, I think that's the best analogy I've heard of protein folding. Now, now this uh, protein folding is in my mind is going to switch from an image of folded or crumpled paper to Pac-Man of different colors. And a different <laughs> color essentially uh, represents what kind of sugars or what kind of molecules it can chomp on. Absolutely. I think that's a, a good analogy to start off, considering, you know, you said there was a five-year cutoff here. <laughs> Don't okay. that. So yeah. now, this is very interesting, right? I mean, I, I, have a, I have this graphic image of how proteins fold in my mind now. But do you guys actually see this in under? Is that how they actually look under a microscope? How, how are you guys seeing this? How do you observe proteins folded? So there's a lot of inferential work that is done. You don't really see it, see it. There's, there's enough information gleaned from freezing. Let's call it freezing the, the, the folding process. And there's also ways to interrogate it. And when I say interrogate, I mean you could change those beads one by one by one through biotechnological means and see if the folding rate changes. And then you can sort of take snapshots. Instead of instead of requiring a high-speed video camera to do it, there are ways to, to kind of take a, a good SLR picture of it. And, and then you can then put those images together in sequence and you can kind of elucidate the, the, the sequence of how these things are happening. Uh, and the actual mm-hmm. pathway. Now, that being said, that is very, very sort of cutting edge and very challenging work to do. And uh, there are other ways to to kind of understand it without really needing to sort of visualize it as a, as a video. And nowadays with molecular dynamics simulations, known as MD simulations, you can render every single atom in three-dimensional space in a computer and put in all of the basic rules of physics and chemistry. Like, you know, if there's charged particles next to each other, then they will either attract or repel. And you can do this at scale, right? And then you can kind of visualize the entire protein as if you were at the scale of the protein. And so the more refined the models get based on the information you get from other science and other experiments, the more uh, informative these simulations themselves become. So it's a little bit of a bootstrappish process. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, we, we're learning and we're obviously improving the models as we go. And we kind of, we, but there is no all-encompassing route for protein folding, which is why we're even doing this research in the first place, which, you know, brings us into these all these sort of paradoxes and, and, and questions as to, well, you know, what if I change this? What happens if I change this? I think, Vikram, you were saying earlier, why does it need to fold in this way? Right. So if I change that one bead at that end or somewhere in the middle, it suddenly changed the fold and it crumpled into a different ball of yarn. So the question is, why does that even happen? Yes, we've seen that it happens. We know that it happens, but we don't really understand why. And that is the that is that is the most fascinating and frustrating thing about these these molecules. So it looks like there is a law that nature is following that dictates the folding of these proteins, but it is probably the greatest kept secret of life that we are not privy to yet as human beings. You know, that's that's not an understatement. I, I think one of the, the, the holy grail of, of protein science is to, to be able to understand this given any sequence of amino acids. Basically, if I gave you a string with any number and any sequence of these colored beads, you should be able to tell me exactly what three-dimensional structure it will form. We do not know that yet, which is kind of crazy to me at the same time, right? I mean, we have all this amazing knowledge. We know so much. We have all these orthogonal ways of sort of tapping into the system. And without knowing this per se, we can still make the most amazing medicines 
absolutely life-changing, you know, technology out there, just sort of treating it a little more empirically without really knowing the fundamental mechanisms. And that's because, you know, these things are reliable. There are some rules like you, like, you know, like you alluded to, and, and we have some understanding of it. And sometimes it's enough to actually have these breakthroughs, whether it's vaccines or it's, you know, therapeutics for cancer or anything like, you know, pick any medicine. There's, there's so much that we know and yet there's so much that we don't know. So it's, it's a very interesting place to be as a scientist. So initially, I, you mentioned that there are an infinite number of combinations given these 20 basic beads, colored beads on a string. The number of possibilities are endless. So it sounds mm-hmm. like to me, it's a gigantic computational issue. Yes. So we have today probably the greatest computing in the history of mankind. We have supercomputers and I have come across this other project called Folding at Home, which means that you can even contribute your own personal computer and your own uh, CPU. And it's in the show notes. So we have practically everybody's personal computer at our disposal, if you're willing to contribute to this project. So... You, in spite of all this, we are not able to overcome the computational complexity that is involved in predicting protein folding? Sadly, yes, uh, because you cannot brute force this problem. That I think that is the fundamental block. Uh, and why you can't brute force this is because the sample space is gigantic. So Vikram, instead of, so what you're telling me is instead of using my compute resources towards mining Bitcoin, I should rather put it towards protein (laughs) folding and at least save a life. Yes. And eventually make an NFT out of it. Whatever (laughs) that means in this this space. You see, Bitcoins are only 21 million, right? But the past, so how much are you going to mine? There are only 21 million Bitcoins. But if you can solve protein folding, you have solved the secret of life. So yes, please contribute to that instead. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, Mo, you made a joke about N- NFTs. None of the three of us know nothing about it, but I'm sure what you said makes sense. <laughs> because in uh, in our space with yeah. this protein folding, uh, you know, the conversation, NFT probably stands for non-folding talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! I'll give you a B minus on the joke. <laughs> oh my god yeah i'll take it i'll take it but let's let's talk about this i know vicky you mentioned you know we have all these computational resources you would think that you know this is something that's really truly within our grasp and that we should be able to solve this problem and the reason that we can't is because it's it's just too too large a sample space uh, and so we we'll, let's try and use this beads on a string analogy to to kind of break it down right so let's talk about maybe a five bead string so nothing crazy here. And and let's assume that these five beads fold into something that looks like you know, a little bit of a knot, a small knot. You could hold it in your wrist. Okay, It's a reasonably sized bead, about a centimeter. So you have something that crumples into maybe an inch in diameter. Now, we said that the beads have a distinct relationship with each other, they, you know, based on their properties, some basic biochemical properties, charge, whether they're sticky, they like water, they don't like water, uh, etc. And so that determines the kind of relationship between the two of them. So if you take two beads, or the first two, let's take number one and number two, you know, blue and red. If you If you lock the position of one bead, then the red bead, let's just say it can be in one of three angles relative to the blue bead. So it can be either, you know, look at, look, if you're looking down the string, and if you have the blue bead, the red bead can either be here, maybe so at zero degrees, maybe at, you know, 120 degrees, and then maybe at, you know, 240 degrees, and then back at zero. So one of three confirmations. Let's call that a confirmation, right? So any three angles. So let's look at it this way. So if you're looking at it, think about it, something like a Mercedes uh, symbol, Perfect. Right? You've got three places. So you're looking at it. Yes. You want to put the second bead at any of the three tips of the Mercedes symbol. So these are your three choices. That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. And now you extend that to the relationship between bead number two and bead number three, bead number three and bead number four, f- four and five, etc. Right? So it becomes an N raised to three number of combinations, Right? where n is the length or n minus one if you want to get into the details because the first one is locked. Mm. So let's say for a 100 bead string, there are 99 such. So it'll be 99 raised to mm. three. Uh, 
what I did was I was very generous with the number of confirmations that you can use. I said you can do three. Okay. But there's infinite. If you look at it in three-dimensional space, there's the whole 360 degrees. So you can either sample it every degree, every half degree. It's limitless, right? But even if you lock that down, now, actually, in nature, there are some very specific angles that you can actually work work the, the amino acids relative to each other. They're known as the phi and psi angles. So that's the sort of actual actual limitations of where these things can exist relative to each other. Even if you take those limitations into account, and if you could sample every single combination at a picosecond scale, okay? Every picosecond, you can sample one confirmation of one bead relative to each other. When you scale it to the length of a protein, given the phi and psi angles, it will take longer than the age of the universe to compute the entire chain's entire sequence, the entire set of folds, which is impossible. Okay, so but the paradox that, that Cyrus Leventhal talked about, I think in 1968, 1969, was that this is, a, and this is a thought experiment, right? We didn't really, I mean, there aren't really beads on a string. They are amino acids. They exist in real, in, in nature. The thought experiment was, yeah, okay, it, it would take a really, 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 really long amount of time to, to, to compute all of those folds and, and map them out and have a piece of paper in which you can draw them out and say, oh, okay, look, the one that is in nature is number 9 trillion, 451, you know, billion, whatever. Okay. But nature, and in nature, this happens on the millisecond time scale, right? So, because proteins are, are, are translated, they are read off, you know, the ribosome, they're generated off the ribosome in the cell and they kind of fold kind of immediately and boom, they're ready. It's like, it's like animals in the wild, you know, the, the, the giraffe gives birth and that, that the baby giraffe can walk in, in no time. It's basically that at the, at the molecular level. That's a terrible analogy. We're sticking with it. So the paradox is that it happens in nature at the millisecond time scale and these proteins are viable and they work. But if you were to brute force this algorithm computationally, it would you wouldn't be able to solve the problem. So what gives? What are those rules that we don't know? We are very we're occluded. We don't really understand fully what's going on. But I obviously have to dis you know there is a disclaimer there in that we are shining more and more light on that every single day. There's there's a lot of research, and I do do not want to discredit anyone's effort in doing it. It's a noble problem to solve. But like you alluded to earlier, Vikram, the it is the answer to life. If we can figure this out, then I can give you any amino acid sequence and you would be able to tell its exact fold. And that's what nature does in the scale of milliseconds to a second, roughly. Yeah. That's incredible. <clears throat> okay. So now all of this stuff, right? All these experiments that you're running. So what, what does an experiment look like? So I'm guessing that a large number of experiments that you run are trying to take X number of amino acids, put it in a chain and study how it folds. Is that what you're, I mean, how do you, what, what are your experiments like? Yeah, that's one. That's, I think, protein folding labs specifically interrogate and, and try and test different sequences to see if there's any impact on the function of the protein and, you know, how long does it take to fold? And some of my research actually had to do with trying to understand the interactions between beads in the sequence and through sort of relying on what evolution has already done. So, Another sort of twist to the story is that there are a lot of proteins and proteins exist that they, they can be called the same name. It doesn't really matter. That can execute the same function in different organisms, it, in humans, in maybe you know, an albatross that flies really high in the sky or in a little bacterium that sits at the bottom of a deep sea vent. And these proteins can do exactly the same function in these different evolutionary niches. Right. So you'd expect their structure to be identical, maybe, or close, you know, very, very, very similar. And uh, since their structure is, you know, is, is derived from or sort of dependent on the sequence, because we've already established that the exact sequence determines the fold, right? That the sequences would also be the same. Now, that's, that's the wrench that nature has thrown at us. 
this, these sequences need not be the same, and they aren't. We've seen in nature that there's families of proteins they can, that can do, execute the exact same function, break down the same sugar, and, and do the same thing in, in a metabolic pathway, for example, but can have slightly varying structures, slightly, and vastly different sequences. So now the, that opens up another can of worms. It's like, okay, wait, what? I thought a sequence determines a fold, mm. and I thought it's going to be only that. But nature has allowed for some wiggle room. Right. I mean, very literally, there is wiggle room, wherein very similar sequences. And now you can start quantifying what this word similar means. You can start thinking about these similar sequences and the impact on changing those specific positions on the activity of the protein on on its function so are you saying that if if we we, we go back to your previous example of a, a protein with a five beads right for five beads of specific colors sure so that could fold in different ways and could behave differently in a bacterium versus an albatross versus a human no, it could fold in slightly different, different ways, ways based on the, maybe you change the fifth bead, okay. but it'll do the same function. Ah, okay. So that's another twist, right? You'd expect the same sequence, to one sequence to do one fold, to do one function, but it is there is some amount of promiscuity, so to Got speak. Mm. So the sequences are different, but that means the physical structure is also different, but they perform the same function. They will be they'll be very very similar. There may be minor changes in parts of the protein that may not be critical to the execution of the function, mm. but exist there for a reason. Maybe because it helps the albatross metabolize faster. Or okay, maybe I think the easier analogy is suppose this the same protein exists in humans and in a bacterium that lives at the bottom of a deep sea vent. Right, deep sea vent extremely high pressure, extremely hot. And proteins are biological molecules. They are inherently fragile. And uh, what that means is that they are as stable as they need to be in the niches that they exist, right? You don't need a protein in your body to be able to tolerate boiling temperatures. That is just a waste of evolutionary resources to have to find that sequence, right? That, oh, you know, you're rock solid, great. <laughs> so yeah. no use for you. Yeah. So over time but what has happened is those sequences have changed enough that they can do this exact metabolic function but they can tolerate that extreme heat and pressure because it is critical to the organism's survival and so that is where those slight differences come in in the sense that maybe the catalytic activity is the same but some structural component is is different and that is where you'll also begin to see the delineation of or mild delineation of structurally important positions in the protein and catalytically important positions in the protein. So it's not all, not all amino acids are equal, but some are more equal than others. So that's a salute to George Orwell right there. <laughs> so it's what is important from this example you just gave is that even slight changes in protein, uh, you know, in the protein or the sequence of amino acids can create vastly different impacts on an organism, like the deep sea vent organism versus us, you know, chilling out by the beach kind of an organism, right? But Absolutely. doing the same function, which means conversely speaking, suppose we figure out nature's secret of how to predict the fold of a given amino acid sequence, which means that we can now engineer life to the way we want it. That is exactly right. And before we even go to engineering life, which is, uh, if you look at a single celled organism, right, that has life, that has a complex set of biological functions being executed in real time. It's really, really complicated, even though it looks pretty boring under the microscope. Now, I don't want to, you know, uh, sling mud at any biologist, but before we even get to engineering life, I want to take what you just said and even dial it down to the level of let's engineer the proteins, right? So protein engineering as a field itself is, is vast. There's so much that can be done to just make biologically active molecules and engineer them for a specific purpose. Now, I don't know if you remember, but back home in India, we had a new set of these dishwashing uh, liquids and, and soaps being marketed. And they were like, oh, it has enzymes for catalysis to break down, you know, dirt and crime and stuff. You remember that? It was like you know, such a and they show these, thing. these gooey little things running all over. <laughs> now, unfortunate as the scaling is, 
in terms of the size you can you can't see these things they're microscopic the the reality is that we were making these proteins and these enzymes and they are exactly what we talked about at the beginning of the conversation they're they're three dimensional molecules that are are very precise and can do very precise functions very quickly i will add that i was a little underwhelmed by those advertisements because by that time i had fully understood what enzymes were and i was like face farming every time those ads would play yeah. so like first of all that is as big as like you know a golf ball compared to like the earth and you're showing the earth in the ad i mean these enzymes are molecules <laughs> they're not little bugs you know so uh, the next yeah. time one of your uncles ask you son what do you do uh, for a living tell him hey your shirts are cleaner because of me <laughs> your dishes are cleaner because of me <laughs> you know i had um, uh, i was talking to there was one gentleman who was asked this question i don't i don't remember who he was but it was a while ago in my field and someone had asked him oh, what do you do for a living and he was in you know like therapeutics biopharmaceuticals and he gave a, a somewhat dark answer he said I help you die better. Oh my god. <laughs> Which while precise <laughs> can be a little disconcerting. <laughs> And unfortunately that hasn't left my mind. I'm tempted to often say that. So I have to check myself when someone asks me yeah. what do you do for a living? Oh, I make medicines that extend your life that help you die better. No, no, no. Let's not say that. <laughs> By the way, now that you mention this, you know, how to die better because we have better drugs. Does all this like, you know, protein uh folding and the discovery of how these things behave actually help us make better drugs absolutely it's undeniable i mean a lot of the interactions between molecules whether it's an enzyme eating its substrate or it's an antibody binding an antigen which is the you know fundamental basis for a lot of treatments of lots of um, cancers and and immunological disorders and what not all of that is informed by that very very specific um, site or sites or those specific sites of interactions between molecules Hmm. so you they're called you know binding sites or or interacting sites or whatever now and remember that all of these surfaces and points of contact between molecules maybe you're trying to block the function of a cell that's gone haywire and right that can be implicated in in cancer right so you want to be able to specifically bind one type of cell and you want to do this quickly you want to do this reliably you don't want any promiscuous binding and off target binding because then the drug is 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 doing random crazy things and and you want to be able to also clear the drug from the system so i am capturing very very sort of very broadly and very i've simplified a lot of the prerequisites for what a, a molecule like that should 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 be like what its behavior in the blood stream should be like you know is it something that you have to ingest well if you're going to ingest the molecule it has to survive the you know the digestive tract it has to survive the digestion process it has to enter your blood stream it has to find the cancerous tissue it has to bind the cancerous cell it has to maybe trigger another set of events to maybe uh, trigger your immune system to rec- recognize that troublesome cell and and then you know then the your immune system can attack the cancer cell and then you're sort of treated of that cancer and so you know when with as far as these mechanisms are concerned i really like talking about them from a from a like a warring government and agents and spies kind of uh, view your immune system is basically a highly coordinated network of agents and warriors and informants and and battle structures and databases and you know <laughs> stuff like that and viruses and cancers are infiltrators that's they basically the analogy right that's how they override that's how they cheat and that's how they can stay hidden you know cancerous tissue basically evades uh, the immune system so uh, a lot of new age cancer therapies and and treatments are immunocentric which is we will not directly target the cancer we will act as flags we will act as guides you know you so you deliver a molecule that can basically specifically it doesn't kill the cancer cell but it it flags the cancer cell so its only job is to alert your immune system mm. so it is now you can think of it as a, as a as a, as a target like you're you're painting it's like you know you're able to get in there you're painting the target and you're and you're leaving nice. so that so that way you're leveraging the body's own system so it's you know quote and quote a little healthier a little safer a little less toxic at least those are the plans and those are the that's the vision of drugs like this so these drugs go in and put like bullseye targets on the problem cells for the immune system to then come and take over 
So it's not actually, yeah. cu- you know, taking care of the problem cell on its own. It's just putting a target on it and, you know, getting out of yeah. there so that the body's immune That's system right. can do it on its own. Yes. So is protein folding just one of the mechanisms of drug development? Are there like other bases for drug development that are popular? Protein folding in general is the phen- the, the collective set of phenomena that determine the three-dimensional structure from the sequence information. Understanding protein folding has implications on drug development, but it, it's not like that is the pathway to drug development. Drug okay. development can happen and does happen irrespective of that, right? So at the end of the day, like I said, there are interacting sites and we can interrogate and change those beads so that those proteins can, you know, either look, you know, like triangles attacking a sphere or squares attacking a sphere or you have a concave surface that attacks a sphere which is ideally you know the, the best match uh, we can do that without really having to worry too much about protein folding uh, that but that isn't to say that it's you know fully exclusive of course understanding uh, protein folding means that maybe you can engineer uh, a better concave structure right to attack a ball like cancer cell for example i'm really pushing that that analogy very very far it's about to break but we can we can take a, we can take a step back and you know yeah let's see it. if we can uh, take a step back and see you know how we can use a simple example right we all get these like mild fevers or whatever and we go to a local grocery store or drug store and get a little tylenol advil crocin you know there are so many brand names but i guess they're all paracetamols ultimately or how do you even make something like that let's say you know i ask you hey can you make me a, a a drug that reduces the body temperature so how would you even start on a problem like that well other than asking for a billion dollars i would require <laughs> <laughs> what is called as a compound library so you know back when we didn't really know that much about biologics based drugs and protein folding was not very very well developed as a field and we didn't really have a, a very good grasp on biotechnological tools medicinal sort of chemistry was 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 the way to go and so you had compound libraries you know organic compounds and organic chemists would well organic chemists would make organic compounds that 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 spanned a variety of different shapes and and sizes and they had a huge plethora of properties and and you could make these way way faster than you can make a biologic you can make them very rapidly you can make a very very large variety of these things and you would basically have you know pharmaceutical companies that owned these compound libraries and then you would really rely on thorough screening hmm. so the science is not in the generation of uh, the molecules alone it truly is in the the, the ability to screen for uh, a valid function being able to reduce like you said the fever or 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 you know help attenuate some some trauma right some for some reason yeah, whether it's to increase the rate at which a blood clots when you have a a cut or you, you so all of that is is born out of a marriage between a chemistry uh, from a, from an organic ke- chemistry standpoint and a knowledge of biology as it continues to progress over time and so being able to see which of those interacting partners can interact can lead to the development of pharmaceutical compounds so is that so what you mean by a... screening like as in you got all these compounds in a library and you have some effects they generate and it's like a match match one to the other is that what screening is that screening is basically that the the actual experimentation that i know subhu you were sort of asking earlier what do we do mm-hmm. i think that is the core of the experimentation it's you know one is making the molecules and having a vast array and tools but then only one re- re- wrench really can tighten the bolt right and so you have to t- try the different tools to see what fits and what can do the function the best okay. what doesn't hurt your hand what is easy to tune to different varieties of bolts what has a reliable metal let's say Uh, or what has an aesthetically nice uh, pleasing shape you know pick your analogy but the idea is that screening is where the challenge of finding the right molecule 
or the the best molecule within within the the, the list that you have and, and so a lot of the data analysis and promoting those molecules through a pipeline so to speak is where that comes from nice the idea so, of screening for the best function and finding the best molecule for that purpose so you have a, a bunch of scientists whose main job is to show up at work every day and create these molecules and i guess by trial trial and error figure out how those molecules behave and if it is something novel then add it to the database that is a uh, good oversimplification yes <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of us just turn up we high five each other we run one experiment we find the best molecule and a billion dollars later we have the drug so you just do <laughs> yeah, random shit till it you, works but before <laughs> exactly right i mean but that's where a lot of empirical work actually empirical, comes yeah. in right so treating things if, if, like an engineer actually really helps which is where i sometimes find myself like it's great to have that uh, ability to t- tap into the fundamental science and see what you're doing but at the same time you want to be able to zoom out look at it from a slightly broader perspective treat it, treat your uh, engine or experiment as a black box and and just time is money so at the end of the day you want to find something quickly uh, rather than and uh, later so but but to, to your answer to your question subhuti the experimentation and the data base and the data analysis yeah that is promoted down the line and you have to do a lot of experiments to first of all repeat those effects and right? it could be some random effect maybe the sun was shining through the window that day and so oh. you know that heated it a little extra and something worked so that kind of scientific what what what, what, what is the right word repeatability repeatability and testing the veracity of it is really mm. critical i think now that being said before you even you know it just it doesn't just go to the market as a drug it doesn't turn up on the shelf yes. that's where it needs massive approvals uh, there's a huge approval process the fda is involved drug goes through trials it has to really be effective it has to really not kill kill the patient i mean that's probably side effect number 1 and <laughs> and uh, yeah oopsie oh, but it's especially funny when you see drugs you know unfortunately that are advertised as okay i think robin williams had joked about it on his yeah. stand up show that he he was looking into a drug or to take a drug i don't know what it was for and i could be completely wrong here he joked about oh side effects might cause anal leakage <laughs> and his and his uh, his, his uh, the problem he had with that was uh, that it was not a side effect like that is an effect <laughs> that's what he said <laughs> oh god that is incredible okay so two questions now the I mean, we're talking about trial and error, empirically studying molecules and things like that, sure. right? Now, we know that, I mean, some popular drugs like penicillin were mm-hmm. discovered through accident, right? Now, mm-hmm. now, the question is that, like, what percentage of these drugs, what, how much of it is accident and how much of it is, like, you know, intentionally drilling down and meticulous experimentation or, I mean, you know, you know, you know where I'm going with this? Almost, how much is it I, I how much is it is fluke is what i'm asking very 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 little i think the kind of breakthrough so why penicillin is even there in the public consciousness is that because it was revolutionary right we had no idea that there was such a, a biological mechanism right that <clears throat> that there was a set of compounds generated by a fungus uh, that can do this or uh, so it's kind of crazy that well it was, i think it was also a little bit of an eventuality like i i believe that a lot of discoveries in science and as we progress as a species in the great universe that we live in are eventual discoveries so those are the sort of maybe known i think penicillin to us at that time was definitely an unknown unknown so that's that's why it was so it was a game changer and the fact that we could then mimic the the uh, the biological processes in a chemistry lab to make that class of molecules and then change uh, a few of the bells and whistles on those molecules and i'm definitely oversimplifying here to to attack different kinds of infections and fight against different kinds of infections that was a game changing thing it was unbelievable and unheard of right there was no idea that we could do this and then we did it and then obviously the effect on you know like like the war happened and so you know with with injuries and infections it was definitely it had a, a truly global impact and we we see that across the board over time whether it's the development of medicines or the development of technology right so penicillin is one example but the polymerase chain reaction pcr is another example and some of the 
the vaccine is is ridiculous it's it's, a, it's like it's so present right now but when you fast forward to 50 years later it's going to be looked at as one of the major feats of human kind i would say it rivals the uh, the landing on the moon you mean the generation of the covid vaccine in the time span that we did it as a human species to combat something totally unknown uh, to our kind yep and you know yep. have a mass produce a vaccine that works to a large percentage on almost the entire population with almost minimal side effect i would say yeah absolutely has never been done before and if it has been done before if i've gotten my facts wrong not at this scale so definitely this while the scale of this enterprise is is incredible the fact is that the mrna vaccine platform as a as a sort of technology is is revolutionary we always knew that we could do this i think there were a lot of difficulties and challenges faced by companies who dabbled in mrna technology and you know thankfully companies like moderna had a lot of their platforms in place so and this is where the sort of empirical testing and screening really is important like you can have the best knowledge but if you and you can make the what you think is the best molecule but there's no way to really truly test its its uh, efficaciousness uh, and its effectiveness if you don't have the right screen and to be able to do that for millions and millions and millions of molecules very very rapidly so i think a company like like moderna this may be like a plug for them an unintentional plug for them but that's okay they are they are i think at at that you know they're on the pinnacle right now but the um the fact that they could do that is 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 a big deal it's a big deal just for the human species not just for the company from a biology point of view why do you view this discovery and you know implementation of the covid vaccine and it being mrna based as some, something so significant to human kind i kind of stated it from oh, a uh, layman's perspective but from a biology point of view why do uh, you think it's significant it is significant because we'll need a little bit of a primer before we can apply this layer of paint so here go the here go all aboard the analogy train once again Let's so go. Okay. so the basic sort of paradigm of molecular biology is dna is transcribed to form rna and rna is translated to form protein so we have all lived through the the excitement of the human genome project right we all know that was in the public consciousness for a decade uh, so many i think billions of dollars were spent on kind of decoding the human genome so why was this so important right and this is like really a sort of far step back so you have to bear with me a little bit but the the idea that we will have an end to end knowledge of the alphabet that makes up a human life was undeniably attractive it was absolutely essential that we understand this as a species because all uh, proteins come from dna right they they it's that sequence that we spoke about of proteins is is a photocopy and and here's where the analogy comes in right so let's just talk about this dna is the blueprint of all life okay and i'm again oversimplifying but if you think about this as the coca cola recipe right the, the recipe for coca cola is supposedly stored in a locker somewhere and there's just that one copy you know if you take that same analogy dna is that one copy it's in the cell but you have to make coca cola so you someone has to take a, a, have access to that copy that blueprint they have to have access to a highly regulated xerox machine <laughs> to generate the photocopies that only one fedex company can ship to the different printing centers at different coca cola factories so that you can make coca cola right so in this analogy the photocopies the mr the, the rna the mrn the messenger rna okay and the the factories are the ribosomes that take the the transcript the mrna transcript which is the black and white photocopy the blueprint stays in the locker okay and and then takes all the ingredients the different beads on the string and is able to make this 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 coke bottle which in this case analogy is the protein so to to be able to read that blueprint in its entirety would mean to know everything about cola <laughs> if you want to take that analogy <laughs> to the limit right 
So that was the human genome project. Now, in biotechnology, we can sort of interrogate all these amino acids and, you know, change these different protein sequences and study protein folding because we can change the DNA. We can shove this DNA into a microorganism and the microorganism can act as the, the photocopier and the factory at the same time. Great. So we can make different kinds of cola. Let's say the cherry cola and the orange cola based on how what, what we tell how we are hacking into the transcript in the in the locker in the in a, or in the dna in the locker okay so is that an analogy okay with us so far nice so far so good right so far so good so yeah. far so good okay so, so this is a big a bit of a story the only problem is those mrna copies right they are like the glasses that tom cruise wears in mission impossible they self destruct in 5 seconds after the message is read <laughs> which is to say that uh, <laughs> This class of molecules is inherently unstable and that has to do with the fundamental sort of molecular structure there's you know uh, there's an extra oxygen somewhere and i'm not going to get into those details but so it's nature's uh, you know layer of you know security like security because yeah. you don't want these the, messengers to hang around with copies of important information so once you deliver the stuff you have to you know eradicate yourself right exactly it's it's a very efficient and also more than the security it's scalability okay one factory needs maybe one copy okay and then you can have 10000 factories and and so you can and and the moment the factory uses the copy it it breaks down right it's eradicated but if i kept sending a stream of copies to the factory i can really make this a highly scalable system and that's exactly what happens in the cell you essentially have the one main tra- you know blueprint mm-hmm. kept in the nucleus of the cell for for eukaryotic organisms or that do- that have a nucleus and that dna is transcribed and so there's again regulated xerox machines that forms the mrna and the mrna then gets translated in a ribosome where the amino acids are kind of put together based on the mrna sequence so literally the dna really informs what the protein sequence is going to be that's that's the basic paradigm now the problem is that you think well why do we have to keep messing around with the dna why can't we just change the mrna and hack the system and then you know we'd be set right but well, that's because the mrna is unstable so that's one of the main reasons so to be able to go and vaccines in general when we deliver vaccines and older sort of vaccines and that sort of typical vaccine if you think about it is a protein or a a killed virus right an attenuated virus like the flu vaccine that you normally get every year and these vaccines are basically you can think of them as ghosts that you introduce into the cell or into the into the human body and uh, when you introduce these ghosts or the vaccines into the human body your immune system remember it's that informant network and it, that's, that's that spy network they see they're like hmm this, this this thing looks suspicious maybe i should call home guard and tell them to you know prepare prepare some troops and keep them ready and that's exactly what it is you're training the body to recognize it so when or if you are unfortunate enough to get infected by a virus that that the ghost was derived from Hmm. then guess what your immune system can go to red alert immediately before that virus and that infiltrator really infiltrates your system and does its job which is to make you unhealthy so that's what so that's sort of we segued sort of very organically into what a vaccine is but that's a regular um, vaccine that, that host, those, those are the kind of vaccines that we that's a regular vaccine okay Exactly. So uh, so there you think of them as viruses that are attenuated they look exactly like the real virus except that they have no properties they're just a shell mm. of its former existence okay now how we make that I'm not going to go into that mm-hmm. but the idea with the mrna vaccine is remember that these viruses are proteins themselves they have pro you know they're, they're mm-hmm. a protein coat it's a shell of proteins mm-hmm. right so let's not forget the basics here those proteins were derived from mrna which came from dna so ideally you might want to be able to introduce dna and then your body doesn't discriminate it says yeah it's dna i guess we you know we'll send it to the uh, photocopiers we we'll make some mrna they'll make some cola 
whatever that's what that's what you think the body will do the body is not that naive right the body is also a little regulated it's like hmm, this looks suspiciously different i don't trust this document maybe the spies are trying to outspy us and it, it can get really messy so unfortunately this analogy is being pushed to its limit but hey that's that's what we do so the idea what with mrna vaccines was let's introduce the mrna circumvent that security in the main locker let's just go straight to the xerox machines that's, that's kind of what that's kind of what we're trying to do here okay. so you're giving the body enough information it's useful you're not you're not really you know trying to destroy the body through the vaccine like that mm-hmm. defeats the purpose so you're trying to give the body it's think of it as a benevolent third party okay <laughs> a benevolent third party has infiltrated both sides of the war mm. and has said i favor one side <laughs> so i want to give the body the team on the left which is you know the few hum- the humans that want to survive they seem like good people okay. some some information that might benefit them and so, so suddenly the body's like whoa there's this photocopy out here it's it's like Oh my god it's sugar free cola i guess we can make this <laughs> it's friendlier than regular cola so i guess what we're doing is yeah. we're telling the the messenger rna don't go to the, the to the nucleus of the cell where you normally get your instructions why don't you use this instead to make some photocopies Yeah you're telling the ribosome yeah yeah the the mrna is the photocopy so oh, you're coming okay. in with the fresh okay. photocopy saying hey hey guess what like oh, okay so you kind of i mean there's a, there's a little more yeah, that goes yeah. on there's a little yeah. bit of a back and this forth this is like a, that you know in your in your exam in your high school you have a little chit with the answers right a little help on the side <laughs> so this looks like that yeah. <laughs> the things i've had to resort to huh? i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> so we basically gave a cheat sheet or a, one of those chits to our body yeah. and that's essentially what the covid vaccine is saying here you that's go that's what any you can vaccine is exam. Yeah, it's just that oh actually let's take, let's take a different analogy so the no, say the teachers have figured out that the students are passing chits okay, okay. so you start writing them in morse code <laughs> and now they can't read it <laughs> everyone in class gets it but the teachers can't so Yeah. So that's how you fool the body into accepting this new set of instructions and to trick the yeah. factories into making more proteins based on these instructions you just gave. And what is the protein that that the body is going to make? It's going to make the the, the covid uh, spike protein. Mm. Yeah. So then you're making the ghost. Mm. you're not just delivering the ghost to the body you right. gave the body the blueprint to make the ghost which is like some next level next operation level. oh my if... god dude i have a <laughs> yeah seriously this is such an enlightening episode <laughs> so this is why it is like a feat this is ni- never been done to this level it of scale where before. you tell the body to make the ghost instead of giving it the ghost which yeah. is what we've done for decades right giving the ghost now you make it yourself yeah and uh, and the, speaking to the scale of the operation you know p- people had concerns about oh it happened so quickly emergency use authorization this that so without me getting into the sort of uh, b- b- geopolitical Politics. landscape of this whole thing i think the idea here the, what what organizations did and kudos to everyone who worked on all of these teams literally from the truck drivers to the scientists like it doesn't matter every single person here knew that there was a worldwide crisis that needed to be solved and stepped up to the plate so first of all it's a it's human spirit aside from the science mm-hmm. like that to me is is unbelievable that there's a group or there's groups of people out there that just got it and did something about it so that to me is just like yeah. chilling like like right now i'm getting chills just thinking about it <laughs> and and the second thing is a lot of these processes typically in science and in in, in pharmaceutical development are are contiguous right so they're abutted end to end and they can be and that is why you know it takes time because you know there are checkpoints and milestones that need to be hit and there there's a lot of money and effort that goes into these things so you obviously want to minimize the risk as the process progresses in fact the closer you are to making a drug the costlier the risk of failure right mm. if you think about it just from an economics perspective yeah. but in this in this particular case i know that i mean there's a lot of articles in the new york times had a few articles where you know suppose there were three or four lead vaccines or 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 drugs that you know had maybe very competing data very similar data but we didn't really know maybe the effect on the body yet 
I'm just giving one example as a potential route for elimination of one of them. So, so you have four leads, but you can only make one, hmm. right? You only can make one at scale and share that information with the world and deploy those resources to make it. You can't have a variety of the same drug. It just doesn't make sense to do that because then you have heterogeneous effects. You know, maybe someone takes one and the other, like it can be crazy. It can be an absolute storm that you do not want to weather. So, but, but in the spirit of reducing the timelines, the manufacturing side, for example, would make all four at scale ready to deploy. Mm. And then when the one was promoted, they would kill off the three. Oh my God. So we willingly took on having to waste resources, precious resources, because we needed to save time. So the groups of people who made those decisions, I mean, I salute them. It's incredible that we had that forethought. And it's so unfortunate that we had to waste some money and time and, and resources, but we needed the, the vaccine yesterday. See, that is <laughs> really, especially, especially in the beginning, the, especially the beginning of the whole COVID pandemic, right? In the first month, I remember, I mean, we all didn't know what we were up against as a species. Yeah. And it was... You know, the roads were deserted and like in the first few days, a lot of people, including me, we stocked up on groceries and you know, stocked up our pantries. But three weeks later or a month later, we still were in the same spot. We didn't know what we were up against because the death toll was rising and uh, hospitals were uh, inundated. And then I had to restock my groceries. So I go to this uh, local big box store and it was... You know, a scene from one of those uh, movies like Contagion, where they allow, it's a huge big box store and they're allowing only 10 people to enter at a time. And it's, and everyone's like wearing these yellow suits and masks and shields. And I I went out to get some a fresh stock of groceries. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I'm, I might just catch this bug and come back, but there's no food at home. What a terrible time that was. Yeah, but oh my god. Uh, you know actually it's it's very interesting that you mentioned contagion. Um contagion was I think uh, s- somewhat more scientifically Accurate. rooted than most other sort of sci-fi apocalyptic movies with viruses. I, it's it's kind of crazy. I mean, and and the reality of the human condition sort of mixed into that, you know, with whether it's bureaucracy or a power struggle. I mean, those those are real things. And so those are challenges I think that I'm sure people in like all of the companies that made these drugs faced. It's just wh- what do you do? You can't, It's we don't live in an ideal world. And in spite of that, we succeeded. So to me, this is a human fate, like I said, that rivals the yeah. moon landing, I feel. <laughs> That's so. a good explanation. I think uh, it really cleared that up in my mind, at least, as to why this is so amazing. This is yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, I didn't know. I mean, I, I have a newfound respect for this this type of a vaccine. I didn't know after all those countless podcasts and other stuff that and news articles I've read. I didn't have this kind of an understanding as you explained. So, thank you for that. So right. now Vikram and I are both electrical engineers, right? I mean, we are hardware engineers. So from mm-hmm. a from one question that one thing I was curious about is. From a medical electronic standpoint, you spoke about all these developments, right? And all these experiments that you run, all this uh, stuff that happens day to day in your labs. Are you, is most of the stuff, most of your equipment that you use, is it still test tubes and pipettes and centrifuges? Or can you talk about some groundbreaking electronic equipment that has been, that you use and things like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. So the, to answer the first part of the question, no, I think that is uh, definitely a vestige of your uh, time at esteemed uh, university where we did our undergrad. <laughs> Man, every time and, I, and schools. And every time I use that, the, the thing, I mean, I, I was hoping the answer is no, because every time we had to titrate and, you know, find these things. And every time I used the pipette, I drank half the solution. <laughs> oh my God, this mouth pipetting thing. You know, when I, when I, oh my God, it's so crazy that you say this because when I've talked to my peers or, or even juniors and, and even students here that, yeah, I, you know, I had to mouth pipette and, you know, we really, we really understood uh, how differences in viscosity of the liquid that you were pipetting <laughs> affected the your mouth <laughs> because if you if it was too thin and you thought it was like a ghee like thing then you're tasting like i can veritably say i i i know exactly what potassium dichromate tastes like Dude, I'm sorry you have to after 20, that actually forms a sentence in your life i mean i'm serious <laughs> <laughs> and 
20 years later i remember what industrial wastewater tastes like oh, oh my god this gets worse <laughs> What? <laughs> that and that's a complex mixture. I had a, a monophasic one entity kind of thing, and that was how bad enough. I felt like my teeth were going to fall off. Goodness, <laughs> for you, I'm glad that you're here. Industrial waste is is probably like you know, I'm 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 grateful, but also kind of sad that you're not like a teenage mutant ninja turtle. Exactly. Like I'll that, take so potassium hopeless. dichromate any day over Subu stuff. <laughs> I I think so too. I'm with you on that. <laughs> So so that's the first part of the question. No, we don't use that that kind of uh, uh, glassware and stuff, but not on a regular basis. Yes, to handle a few mixtures and compounds here and there, we occasionally use plastics and pipettes that are, you know, mechanical and they have uh, variable volume adjustments and, you know, they can be multi-channel. So because you can do work in a matrix format in plates right now. So that allows you to increase throughput. And that word is particularly sort of close to my heart because I work in a high throughput lab. I do a lot of screening work and we we look, we look at multiple proteins and biologics at once instead of one at a time and so with with the, in terms of experiments and hardware i can give you an example of one device so this I, and i don't know the physics of this so a lot of the devices and experimentation and, and experiments and instruments are based on the fact that the molecules we work with are not viewable under an ordinary microscope right so a biologist in a pure bio biology lab could see a worm and a cell with basic with a very basic optical microscope we can't really do that with what we have and what we work with so you need more advanced technology and it's not just oh just oh we need an electron microscope but there are properties displayed by these molecules that you can sort of track through light scattering through ultraviolet absorbance through fluorescence through you know just there's all these kinds of properties that really are derived from the fundamental makeup of these molecules and so to that effect you know i can give an example we use something called a multi angle light scattering device great sounds amazing what the hell does it do so it turns out that physicists figured out that you take any object that is you know maybe a, a certain size scale and if you have a uh, light being shone on it the the pattern or the way the light scatters as it hits the object is indicative of the size of the molecule great fantastic so and and it is also dependent on the concentration of that molecule in the solution so so you have sort of a, a three variable system vaguely speaking right you have the, the the scattering effect dependent on the size of the molecule and the concentration so now if you knew the concentration of your molecule from some other means this can, this can open a pandora's box clearly mm-hmm. you can now tell what the average size is and i can use that information to tell to tell me if uh, there's a an aggregation of the molecule in question to form larger superstructures like suppose they're all very sticky and they just they do not like being suspended in solution alone for example then you know you would expect the light scattering signal to correspond to its molecular weight oh it's supposed to be 150 grams 1000 grams per mole or daltons but it's behaving like it's something that's 600 600 is a multiple of 150 which means probably they're sitting in groups of four wow mm. so you have to establish a lot of standards and controls to really make sense of this data but you know we've able to, we've been able to bootstrap over over the course of history to kind of make sense of what are the fundamental behaviors and sets of behaviors and then you can kind of glean from that what your molecule looks like or how that behaves so that's one example nice you briefly mentioned what pcr is right you we spoke about the covid vaccine and how that was discovered and what exactly that does and but then i've been to a pcr test site like a dozen times in the last year so when i go uh-huh. to one of these sites and i get my nose swab the throat swab or whatever it is what exactly is going on there what what do they swab and what are they looking for to see if i have covid who and i that. guess what does pcr in this context mean we all use the yeah. acronym now freely polymerase chain yes. reaction is a in my limited understanding is a significant cornerstone of scientific development so i guess you can help us understand why that is so and how it has yep. helped us in this covid journey 
Yep. If I have my historical facts right, and I should, as a scientist in the field, <laughs> with that that, that use has has used and uses PCR every day, it was a Nobel Prize winning discovery by Carrie Mullis, and it really, I think, snowball set the ball rolling or snowballed the the biotech field into what it is today. It was it was a fundamental sort of control over DNA sequences. You could you could alter and mess with DNA and and change the sequence of DNA, which therefore means you can change the sequence of proteins, as we now know, to to your to, to your benefit, to whether it is to explore a function or to to make a drug or or to test something, right? So the idea of taking um, some 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 known DNA, changing it, shoving that into an organism in like Escherichia coli bacteria. And and then having those E. coli bacteria pump out that protein at a relevant concentration in relevant amounts for you to do some biophysical tests meant that we could start doing protein engineering work. Really, that's just the long story short in terms of what PCR is and why is it called polymerase chain reaction. And every time I say the full-fledged sort of the, the expansion of PCR, I remember this Rather terrible movie with Keanu Reeves and Morgan Freeman called Chain Reaction. I don't know if you guys have seen it. But it had something to do with these fusion reactors and a runaway chain reaction. And, you know, obviously everything goes goes to shit. Thankfully, that's the inverse event with PCR. Now, that being said, it is a nuanced experiment and, and work that you can do in the lab. And it's, it's a highly tunable sort of uh, experiment. Well, what it means is you can make vast amounts of quantity. You, It's, it's a chain reaction because... There is multiplicity involved. So, if you think of DNA as a as a he, double helix that you know, you know, we are very familiar with. What you don't see in those images and in those beautiful video renderings is that actually DNA is an, is a set of inverted strands, right? And there, there's a directionality to a strand. So it's and it's not a real ladder. It's not a parallel ladder. It's an anti-parallel ladder that has implications on how sort of some of the molecular mechanisms happen and they go left to right. If you're looking at a frame of reference, if you lock your frame of reference, then you know some some mechanisms happen left to right on one chain, and then some mechanisms happen right to left on the other chain. That's just 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 for general knowledge. The idea of polymerase chain reaction, I think, came about from the stories that he kind of that Kenny Mullis thought about it on on the way. Or he was away for a vacation with his wife, and he conceived the idea in his head, and then left the vacation spot straight to the lab. So I don't know what happened with the, with the marriage, but he definitely got the Nobel for that. So you know, balance, I guess. Uh, but uh, but he he sort of conceived the multiplicity. He sort of thought of it as a thought experiment, and then. Uh, they had some of those sort of, I think, molecules in place. They just didn't put those building blocks together, so to speak. And so the idea is that you can rip apart the DNA strand. Mm. So when you're doing that, you're exposing, let's say, the, the, the print heads of a printer. Mm. Okay, So now you can shove paper in on this side and get a photocopy, shove paper in on this side and get a photocopy. But by by doing that with a molecule that essentially acts as a photocopier, you can now, you have... A, a sort of an exponential rise, right? So one becomes two, two molecules because you have the strands separated. Then you make a matching strand on on one, mm -hmm. right? So if you have a photocopy of the one strand, and then the other strand will now resemble this photocopy, right? Or rather, the other strand is exactly the same as the as the photocopy on the other. Oh, strand. okay, yeah. Or not the photocopy, but it's called a complement. So mm. it's called a complementary sequence. So the two strands already complement each other. Mm. You rip them out, then you make a complementary strand on the one that you ripped up on the left and the one that you ripped up on the right. So now one became two. Mm. Guess what happens? Two becomes four. Mm. Four becomes eight. Hmm. Right. And then so that becomes really multiplicative. And I'm clearly demonstrating my lack of uh, geometrical progressions. But <laughs> the idea is that this becomes an exponential increase in the amount of DNA that you have in place. Ah. OK, yes. this is for doing blank photocopies. I gave you the extremely naive sort of zero level PCR reaction. Right, and you can do this by, by by regulating the heat. And the way it works is so DNA is denatured to expose the antiparallel strands, and then you have what is called as annealing of the primers. So the photocopying machine is called a polymerase, hence the name polymerase chain mm. reaction. The polymerase is just an engine; it photocopies. It can read the the the, the, the DNA base here, and it can put in the complementary base on the other side. Yeah. So it's the photocopier machine. So DNA is basically process. taking the yeah. two strands and like breaking, the, denaturing means breaking the yeah. DNA strands, you know, That's instead right. of two strands, instead of like a double helix, you make it like two single helix. 
two single helices yeah. and then and you, then you, you take some clay so, and then you basically take some clay and create a mold you stick it to each of the each end of the strand and you get yeah. essentially like a like a mold of what it looks like it's like, like it's like fission in cells right if you if you seen yeah. cellular reproduction from under a microscope they just like cleaved in half and then they you know that that mm. gets but actually what's happening at the molecular level in the nucleus is the replication of dna and it looks exactly the same here except that we are doing this in the lab and we can control the way it happens right which is mm. crazy if you think about it you've mimicked a biological process with temperature now why is temperature important because the the, the way it works is there's like three broad steps right so you denature the dna you really boil the crap out of it and then you anneal the primers so remember that mm. the little it needs a little bit of clay like you said so at the very beginning of the, at the of the strand so that the photocopier can start doing its work okay mm. and so the annealing happens at the certain temperature the reading happens at another temperature and then they kind of seal so now you have two copies like we said and then the two becomes four the four becomes eight etc etc now the really cool thing that you can do with pcr and why it's so revolutionary is like not only does it the, the zeroth level is powerful in just making so much so much more dna that you that that you need is that in that annealing stage the primer that you put that allows the photocopier to start can have a forced error okay mm. that forced error or a mismatch means there's some some length of that complementary that sequence that you put in the little bit of dna that you put in that doesn't match at every single base to the parent strand okay there's a parent strand you introduced one primer you thought ha huh, it will be exactly atcc it will be the matching sequence and then they'll continue everyone is happy no you forced the error mm mm-hmm. because you want to make a, an amino acid sequence of your choice so you're going to make sure that the dna sequence matches that amino acid sequence but based off some parent dna mm. right so through forcing that error you will now and if you do the math and i'm not going to get into it you're going to get only the predominant species in the population as this explodes exponentially yeah the predominant species in the population is going to be the dna of your choice with that forced error because you wanted to make that so now you can take that er- error dna or rather your manipulated cloned ah. dna mm. right and put that into a cell and make the protein that you wanted to make so you went from intent to execution mm. because of pcr mm. you could never do that before or you could but it was very 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 hard mm. very laborious very very trivial very difficult to do at scale you can do this in a in a school lab it is taught at the school level nowadays which is ridiculous <laughs> given our backgrounds of where we came from and where we are it was like oh we had to take you know get a degree in the field to kind of understand it and test it in the lab now it's an everyday thing what year really was ridiculous. this uh, nobel prize given what year was this pcr discovered that discover? is a good question and i'm going to try uh, a very sort of joe rogan uh, approach here and try and pull it up for you so yeah. you are you are ajay 1993 okay that's pretty recent then yeah, that late huh yeah it's think about it right so in from 1993 to now we've we've got mrna vaccine technology yeah. that is solving a pandemic level problem <laughs> that's ridiculous so in the pcr Incredible. test that we do by swabbing our noses for covid ah. what happens there they are so we know the sequence of the spike protein and so we know what its dna can look like and so i believe what they're looking for is the presence of that genetic information in the swab which means that the virus is present mm. so you are directly probing for the dna sequence mm. that the virus has so if you think about it, the virus has its genetic information mm. you're sending in the known photocopy saying if the photocopy happens correctly and 25 repetitions later i have 2 to the 25th number of copies holy crap you have the virus that's basically it so you're using the photocopy machine to increase your signal to noise ratio to tell you if there is actually that genetic information which is criti- indicative of the virus or the presence of the virus so your the forced error here is the virus's sequence of dna yeah, the vi- it'll be viral related sequences yeah, yeah. and when you introduce so that so that goes into the tube yeah mm-hmm. and if the dominant process the, the the dominant sequence that arises when you do this exponential multiplication mm-hmm. of dna if that matches mm-hmm. the original sequence you have covid because what multiplied the virals, yeah. was the 
yeah. COVID's virus sequence, uh, DNA sequence. Exactly. And not that's yours. Exactly, uh, that is correct. You're not looking for your sequence. We, I mean, that kind of information is, first of all, irrelevant in this context. Yeah. Right? We were, we're checking to see if you have COVID. And secondly, can you imagine if every single testing facility, I mean, the implications of storing uh, an individual's genetic information, is, is, it's, there's huge implications. And, you know, there's ethics and, and, and regulation and regulatory stuff. So that's obviously much more challenging. So what you're really looking for is, is there viral genetic information at some level mm. in your nose? Mm. If, you, if there is, then it is, we're not just saying, oh, you know, there's, you have the virus. It's very, very likely that you do. Mm. Yeah. Got it. And that you could do because of use. So here, PCR was used as a diagnostic. So you see the, the flavor of applications is, is virtually in, like limitless. Mm-hmm. There's biotechnology for making something that you want. You know, you have quantitative PCR where you can make a set amount of DNA. There's diagnostics like this. I mean, it's and then it's gotten more and more sophisticated in terms of what those primers are. And, you know, it's expanded the repertoire of molecules and photocopying machines that do that photocopying has also increased, mm. which means that there's there's probably uses of PCR out there that even I'm not familiar with. Amazing. It's amazing. Awesome. So we should refresh our drinks and yeah. uh, so let's get <sighs> let's get into it methodically. Now Yeah. You know you are you are an accomplished scientist in your own right, right? And you're doing important work, work that you enjoy. But how did it start? I mean, why biotechnology? Why this line of science and have you thought about, you know, did you get into all of this by accident and by you know, just circumstances of life and decisions back then? Or was there a... Na- do, you, do you feel like it was an ob- obvious tra- trajectory that led you to this? No, there was nothing, I think, obvious about it. And while one can argue that, oh, hindsight is twenty twenty, and, you know, you look back and you say, of course, yeah, that this was inevitable. At any given point in time, you know, you're always trying to operate from the perspective of I'm going to make the best decision I can now with the knowledge I have, hoping for the best in the future. That's it. But there were some, I think, key uh, milestones, right, in this trajectory, so to speak. One of them actually overlaps with you guys, which is kind of insane. I think on a previous episode, you talked about, uh, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. That was mind-blowingly formative for me too, which is, I was like jumping with joy when I heard that on the on one of your previous episodes. I couldn't believe that. Oh, you guys, what? I remember calling Vicky and telling you immediately, like, dude, this is insane. Like, And what that did for me. Like, Let's drill into that. Like, to me, the free-spirited sort of nature of the man was was one thing. But his fearlessness in research, he didn't care about the you know the cost or whatever he he was not bound by those rules not to say that he was you know terrible as a person and did all and blew things up but within reason within his social construct he 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 operated freely and he was curious and he was unrelenting right that tenacity of questioning it didn't stem from an insecurity it didn't stem from at least to my understanding right from a need to to be validated it was genuine curiosity and I think he gave me some permission to ask those questions. I, therefore, I became the one of the most annoying people in my family. Like, there was just, what can you say? Why <laughs> This kid will not shut up asking why. And this is a 19-year-old. It's not a 5-year-old kid. But the idea was just that. Okay, you know, you say we do this. And there are customs and maybe you do this. But why? Like, I acknowledge it. I'm not questioning the, you know, the power structure or whatever, right? It never came across, or at least from, from my perspective, when I asked the question why, I think that was when the, the researcher took root in my uh, being, I think. I think all kids are curious. I mean, you guys both have kids. You know how they operate, right? And and I think maybe for a while that curiosity of mine was dormant and, you know, you're in survival mode as you go through high school. <laughs> Where are you going to be curious? <laughs> Just getting through our education system was a task in and of itself. You guys know that. Oh, yeah. Um, we had a whole episode and, on that too. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Pedagogy is insane. It's a big, big topic. So, but yeah, so the permission to ask why and never really stop, right? The, the frame of reference keeps changing when you ask that question. And then... Uh, Thankfully, having the tools to kind of adapt and let your brain kind of wrap itself around those concepts and and be satisfied with the answer that you are given then, but probe the next level, probe to the next level. I think that that was where the researcher really took root, like I said. So, So the book was one, and that's just one of those random time points. And it was a crazy story how I got that book too. We had some distant relatives visit us for the first time when we were living as a joint family. And I think they didn't expect... Uh, me to be there as one of the cousins they had an, my other cousin in in mind and so they got two books okay and at the time my cousin was interested in cricket and the other book was like something about Rahul Dravid or Sunil Gavaskar I'm not really sure what and they just happened to have bought surely you're joking Mr. Fain thinking that they would give it to my cousin but then what they saw fluke. two kids in the house <laughs> and so they gave one to me and it happened to be that. Otherwise, I don't know, maybe my cousin would have been like the scientist and I would have been like a CPA or something, which is crazy that that, that happened, <laughs> yeah, right? It's such a crazy <laughs> thing. And it's such a great book to get at a certain point in your life. Surely you're joking, Mr. Yeah. Feynman, because it's all these stories about his, you know, adventures about lock picking and, you know, how he did all this various stuff like physics in strip clubs. And it's so, so crazy. It's amazing. Yeah, I know. And, you know, in, in, know. in my my case right i think the reason why this book this specific book i can, you know vikram is the one who ended up getting it i i don't remember how vikram uh got that book but he told me look you got to read this and that's how and we were in 12th and we were preparing for those iit exams right oh my god and i think yeah. that was very formative for me simply because in 12th, while I was preparing for IIT, along with Vikram and a couple of other really good friends, I was not good at all. I, I didn't live up to the mark, right? And if my education in physics, chemistry and math was limited to the instruction we were receiving in class and to those demoralizing exams where I pretty much flunked uh, each and every one of those. So if my, if that, if my exposure to physics was just that, right? instruction in class plus exams then i would have totally ditched science and gone into economics or done some ma or something like that right and i would have concluded that it's not for me but because of books like this which invoke your natural curiosity even though i was flunking these physics exams in my mind i imagined myself to be a it no, it, it it primed it primed my mind to be curious and yeah. start loving, you know, space exploration and all of those other stuff that humanity is attempting. And it wasn't too hard for me to, I, I, didn't, get ex, uh, I didn't get discouraged from these poor marks. And I went on to do some engineering and uh, I like my life right now. That's that's uh, very uh, self-effacing. He went on to do some engineering, pursued physics and uh, physics-like fields in spite of not doing that. That, yeah. that speaks to more of your ability and, and sort of tuning to that uh, research, well, research mentality, so to speak, right? But research mentality, research has, as a word, I think, has gotten such, a, uh, such an unfortunate negative connotation of people just being very, you know, just droning on and being very, wearing, you know, plaid coats and having elbow patches. I think that, yeah. that's the very unfortunate uh, image that it, it con constructs. But but research is exciting because you truly are at the edge of the unknown. I think one of, uh, I saw a very interesting graphical uh, analogy. So when, and, and this is uh, like drawn out on a paper. And I, and I think I may have told you this in the past, Vikram, but we'll just talk about this again. So human knowledge as explained on a two-dimensional canvas, okay? So when you're born, you are a dot, you know nothing, your consciousness has just emerged, so to speak. And so you're just learning to speak, walk. Eat, sleep, fart, poop, whatever. And, and then as you grow, you know, that circle expands and becomes, you know, say, a centimeter in, in, uh, in diameter on a, a scale of, say, the, all human knowledge being maybe the 
the, the size of a parking lot. Let's just say that. And you, your circle is maybe one centimeter. And as you grow, that circle keeps widening. You know, you get a degree. It becomes really quite broad and you have a good understanding. You know, you're in your 20s. You've, you've gotten through a, probably a very critical phase in life as we know it, right? To, to be able to get through your 20s is a parenting win. It's a genetic win, right? As far as the, uh, the, the biology is concerned, you are primed to now pass on those genes in this social con- sort of construct to the next generation and procreate and etc. Now, when you do something like like an engineering or a master's and you start really specializing, that circle starts becoming uh, more egg shaped. So you're, there is now a directionality and there's a vector to your knowledge on this canvas. Okay. And when you get a PhD or an advanced degree, or even a master's in that sense, it that oblong shape and now it's actually expanded into an arrow that goes right to the very edge of this parking lot okay which means you are now literally the world expert in this like there is nobody else who has done what you have done and knows what you know about this very 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 narrow topic so that's why it went from being like a shape that had some area to it to being a line to the very edge of human knowledge and then to do something path breaking is to take that edge of the parking lot and they they show they zoom into the kind of line in this next graphic in the window and it creates a small bump it ex- extends the boundary mm. by a millimeter <laughs> thereby broadening the entirety of human knowledge. Yes. Isn't that a brilliant analogy? I, yeah, I just to see amazing. this kind of visually was it's amazing. It's was, amazing. Was really something. So, and that little bump in human knowledge is is a plenty of a lifetime achievement uh, for most people even. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To be able to do that means, you know, and, and like, you know, the framework of regret, as I like to call it, it's like, oh, if and when, when, when the time comes for you to, to, to move on, you know, maybe you, maybe the bucket of regrets you have is, is tiny. And so that framework of what your regret looks like when, when it's time for you to die, as however morbid that may sound, needs to be, needs to be healthy. It needs to be something that, you know, you don't care about your overall career progression, this, that, and all. Have you lived a good life? Have you done something good, maybe? Have you, you know, minimized the number of regrets you have? And and if you've done all of this while doing path-breaking work and making money and being well-loved, man, that's, that you're a hero. That's like, the dream. Those are rare. Yeah, that's I the feel. dream, yeah. That's the dream, yeah, exactly. And And then... But then that's also not, I think, truly an unachievable goal for folks like us who've had the backgrounds that we've had. And when when I speak to students back home in the same colleges that we went to, I tell them this. I think the first question is born out of insecurity when it comes from the audience. Oh, what about jobs? Sure. That is a valid question, but not to not to sort of decry that that line of reasoning and thinking. You guys are going to have degrees from these universities you are going to be able to find those jobs. You will work hard and you will survive. So trust yourself, trust a little bit in the process. But that's the baseline. Go beyond that, right? Push for your interest. Push for what you want to do. You like If you are insecure about it now, that's, that's healthy and that's good. But it has to kind of, you have to contain it and hold on to it and be inspired. And holding on to that inspiration and seeing it through and eventually achieving your goals that is the accomplishment. I think the the preconceived notion of I will be successful from off the bat. That's it. You know, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to get the best job in the world. I have achieved my life goal. I, that doesn't happen. I mean, that's unrealistic, right? That's right. Yeah. I think a lot of times you have to define for yourself what success means to you. Like is pushing the edge of human knowledge one millimeter is a major form of success. Most people can only dream about you know, you can earn billions of dollars and not do that. But, you know, there are people who, you know, the guy who invented the zipper didn't make a penny. So, you know, I mean, but we all yeah. use it everywhere. Yeah. And I do consider that a bump in one, the, the one mm of human, you know, knowledge because you know, it makes life so much better for all of us. But so, you know, to each person has to define what success means. And where inspiration comes from for that, right? I mean, like we all spoke about, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. Such a good book. We all have common roots to that book, I suppose. Yep. But I'm pretty sure that we've all come across people in our lives who have driven us towards these things. Who are some of the people that drove, you know, you towards being inspired in the field of biotechnology to get you where you are today? 
Absolutely. That's a great sort of a, a cornerstone or a pillar, I think, for, for anyone who does any kind of research. There's either one or, or more individuals who who've done that for sure it's it's there's no single uninspired researcher right and or or musician or whoever i think yeah, it's all a form uh, of yeah exactly so the for me there was there were a few people i think there was there was a mr vasu who was my 11th and 12th standard uh, teacher so this is uh, high school here who taught uh, chemistry and he taught us physical chemistry so this was some of the quantum stuff mm. that was really exciting like electron in a box and stuff like that mm. and it was just like i could not get my head around the the, the fuzzy logic of uh, you know the, the the wave particle duality mm. and things like that which is insane and you just have to accept it and then later on you fast forward 10 years later when you listen to uh, Feynman in these YouTube videos and he explains you know a rubber band and, and atoms and and he says that it would be unfaithful to explain something in the example in the context or through an analogy of something else because that would also reduce to what you are trying to explain now so at some, so, it, so he says that he'd be cheating you if he did that and so he says you at some level or at that level when you drill down to that subatomic level you have to just accept the reality for what it is and yeah. that to me hearing you know mr vasu say that in like 2001 and then fast forwarding to like i don't know 2020 or 2021 say 20 years later that is an immovable truth that just is. Mm -hmm. And that there's some beauty in that, I think. Mm -hmm. I think there's getting that validation when my brain is obviously changed and is less neuroplastic, mm -hmm. I would say, is is mind-blowing to me that that is a reality that just persists irrespective of your belief system. Being able to see that you can engage in dialogue and argue the science and just bash your head against the wall saying, I don't understand it. Like, I understand the premises, I understand the building blocks, but the, the concept doesn't materialize in my head. And Mr. Vasa would, would smile and, and he, he knew what we were going through. Like, that level mm -hmm. of scientific empathy, let's call it that, yeah. was... Now when I look back, was that's it. That became a cornerstone. Yeah. And, and let's rewind the clock. A few years before that, in middle school, middle to high school, so let's, let's talk about 7th to 10th grade, there was another Mr. Hart who taught us physics and math. W what really made it work for me was the clarity with which he taught things. So it was not just shoved down the throat. It was you were baited enough to to, to walk down that path and let your brain wrap itself around physical concepts. And he did that th through structure, right? It was not an unguided situation. It may have seemed very academic and, oh, this has to be done by the syllabus. But he was irreverential enough to the academic syllabus of the school wherein he could get that done. You could do well in the exams. But you also had understanding, which to us, as yeah. you guys know, yeah, was right. like mind blowing if you had something that yeah. really you could connect with. Yeah. And, and that's a good word. Right? I mean, this the scientific empathy is, is a nice way to frame it because a lot of teachers, they just got to get these kids who are maybe, say, in eighth grade past the finish line. That's the main duty. And the, and the finish line being that exam. OK, let's just do mm -hmm. everything we can to just get these students to the finish line but in that whole exercise you have completely forgotten about this curious child who actually wants to know the science and instead you're just trying to you know sort of teach what's in the textbook or the syllabus so in your case you had like a couple of teachers right so in middle school and then one in high school you had those teachers who had the scientific empathy to go beyond just the syllabus and satisfy the curiosity of the students but the thing, the, where it got really, I think, where it assaulted my senses was in graduate school. Because now, well, what is the idea of graduate school, right? Like thinking, going back to that analogy of pushing the boundary of human knowledge, you've come in with a certain set of skills and knowledge. So you are competent enough, not competent, competent enough to do a certain level of research to push the boundary of what you do and learn something, discover something. But you have to get very comfortable with being uncomfortable, to me, that was very difficult. I, and that, I think because 
over time okay you've got these scientific accomplishments you've understood the science you've gotten through school you've gotten through life a little bit you feel like you got this and you know your curiosity uh, is is well satiated by by i think the internet as it expanded and bloomed uh, in you know as we had access that eventually became unlimited right being able to wiki anything google anything meant that you felt like maybe you had access to that knowledge or you had that knowledge at your fingertips literally right but being faced with that ambiguity and uncertainty when a molecule misbehaves or something and there is no handbook for that there is no wikipedia page that tells you what that means getting comfortable with that and and defining a framework of of reference of knowledge and then pushing that really pushing that boundary that we talked about earlier that was i think that was it right that was to me was my phd like just figuring that out and instilling that behavioral aspect into what i do and and then doing that work took a solid 6 years <laughs> it was like my brain just didn't, didn't get it you would get frustrated why is this thing happening i'm trying this i've done everything exactly the same something failed well there was an unknown parameter that you had no idea it was an unknown unknown to you at the time so then you render it as a known unknown and then you shine light on it and then the, and becomes known mm. and then that is how that boundary gets pushed because you're accumulating that knowledge of that experience into the model or whatever that you're trying to build and it's not a model that you're trying to build for the sake of it you really are trying to wrap around a reality that exists again whether you believe it or not or whether you know it or not it's it's there those molecules do what they do but there's a reason for what they do and so you have to wrap your brain around it yeah so so i think graduate school obviously was the most recent formative experience in that sense and then you know the two teachers in middle school and then at the very beginning i think as as early as i can remember it was my grandfather so i actually dedicated my thesis to him oh that's awesome uh, <laughs> yeah so it actually says i think my mom was not particularly happy about it because my mom you know okay middle class indian we slave the beta padega types of situations and and she was like oh this is my grandfather <laughs> i thought it would be us i think like, no of course it was you i have acknowledged you in like a letter that is four pages long but let's leave the blank sheet you know for the, for the man's name so about that so this is really crazy right so my grandparents lived in chennai and we had moved abroad and we would visit every summer and those and i never could understand why his name was dr parmeshwar and i was like first of all he doesn't work <laughs> Secondly, he is not a doctor. <laughs> the irony is that I have a PhD now. So so that's the one thing. And so that curiosity, I would ask truly very innocently, but I would be shushed by, you know, either my dad or my mom, I don't remember, or it wasn't addressed enough to to make me happy, right? Yeah. Just let be like don't and, be disrespectful. <laughs> uh my Or, or no, not even that. I think they were okay with it. But he would catch me. He was, I was the uh-huh. the first born on the you know whatever dad side of thing, and so he was very attached to me, and I was very attached to him. And he would say, he would just smile and laugh. It tickled him to no end that I was blown away by the fact. Like he was like a six year old asking, "Why are you a doctor but not?" <laughs> so. and then it, we had we would spend essentially the whole day together you know running around playing with the neighbors kids whatever and then in the afternoons i had a routine you know there was lunch and i was a very very fussy eater so after a mega lunch we would get i would watch the jungle book the animated disney cartoon and so you know song and dance maybe that's the artistic influence i don't know we'll decide we'll 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 cut that up later and then he had a collection of hardbound books that either my dad had you know brought and and saved over time and they were on like sci-fi so sci-fi from the context of 1989 1990 so this is completely outdated sci-fi by today's standards okay but can you imagine what that does to a child's imagination you open you see spaceships that don't exist renderings of planets that don't exist theories on propulsion that are still vaporware as far as today's technology is concerned so at that age of like i don't know maybe 6 7 8 9 i was exposed to the concept of solar propulsion mm. the daedalus project all this rendered by him by his words i can't read that stuff i don't know what it means and he would just laugh and he was like ah let's see what these aliens are doing today and you know and we would look through this the sci-fi book think about that what a crazy effect my parents had no clue this was happening right <laughs> they are busy with work whatever and one random afternoon 
grandfather sits down this becomes a routine we are opening these random books uh, and i was not allowed to touch these books right they were on a shelf somewhere so maybe the engineering mindset came from yeah. there when everyone kind of goes to sleep and the cartoon is finished i would sneak into his room and quietly try and pull that wooden uh, chair to climb it to climb the table to reach the shelf to pull the book many scoldings later the book is in my lap <laughs> achievement unlocked so i think that was it for me and and oh i remember this one thing so he by he oh, as if i know this guy richard, richard feynman talks about opening up a radio right oh, yeah, the yeah. first chapter right i did that to a to a torch okay it was a, i don't know you remember in india we used to get those those flashlights that were orange plastic with the black the, switch and a black yeah. rim okay yeah. signature like this is just like your run of the mill 80s flashlight it ran those big ever ready batteries and one day i don't know i was inspired let's call it that okay i take apart the whole thing i figure out <laughs> basic electric circuitry yeah. on vacation during power cuts when you need the torch <laughs> when you need the flashlight so and i think probably where i think this i was validated i think for the first time that i remember why my parents were having the scientific curiosity was i i had i figured out which screwdriver to use to open up one of the two screws and whatever and take it up the whole take up the whole thing and remember there was a spring that would also hold the batteries in place and i knew how to take out the spring right those small fingers very dexterous so i think you know vicky you'll relate to you know your kids having that ability with that yeah. with those fingers it's really an advantage being that small i think yeah i think so <laughs> and and i i told them no 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 trust me i will put it back together and it will work on the first try you know raising the stakes challenge Let's accepted go all in yeah right? a challenge accepted whatever they let me be they were probably like oh, we have other fish to fry let's just let this kid do this this thing lo and behold it worked <laughs> put the whole thing back you know what feels like a trivial thing like uh, now i mean can you imagine not knowing anything about positive negative electricity making sure the polarity is correct yeah. making sure the connection with the bulb is correct figuring out where on the screw type the is the negative and the positive yeah. on the bottom empirically tested no idea right i have no <laughs> fundamental concept of electricity as we know it today so that was i think and then and then being validated by the parents to say oh, okay good job whatever you know like yeah, yeah there's going to be a power cut so we need it yeah done that's it yeah the next time the power the power went out you're like yes this light is on because of me and my science because <laughs> of the soon to be you know doctor siddharth mohan so like 30 years later that's nice yeah so is jungle book where you got all your grooves from your rhythm bones because the rhythm bones huh why i have to say yeah. rhythm bones to people who don't know you already is because you're a damn fine drummer as a subu So I'm feeling all left out in this conversation because there is a distinct drummer who once told me like dude you play all this guitar but damn, you really lack a sense of rhythm I'm like oh, you are right I, you are absolutely right no offense taken <laughs> agree the thing is when Sidmo when I first met Sidmo right in the in, in the in our college Indian band he wasn't even the drummer he was hired to play the keyboards yeah and the bass <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's a man It's, of many faces uh, yeah oh no no i was i was belligerent i think with the whole band thing because i had to follow in the wake of the the great black earth and for first time listeners here you know vicky and subu are uh, powerhouse musicians who achieved uh, a lot so it's it's only unfortunate that you guys are not a, still a part of a touring band i would say and i say that i am a, a scientist because i am a failed musician so i'm the other way around you know but yeah i think the idea of grooves um, more so the jungle book was my dad so my we had and we still have to this day the original vinyl records from you know like i think going back to the 70s of of whether it was acdc or pink floyd or dire straits and for example like my dad I, i don't know whether he was he is into music and but he never never really got into metal it was mm. he was a little more eclectic in his tastes uh, and it was just a thing that every weekend in the morning we would play music and i i knew about dire straits i think from the time when i was born which is yeah. kind of crazy because that really shaped the 
you know my aesthetics right and so some of very little classical a lot a lot of rock a lot of what we call classic rock now and i remember see, being fascinated by thunderstruck or mm. acdc and it's like oh you know this is loud screaming metal and we would play it and i'd be like what is that <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> but so that is dad playing music early on again very eclectic and i it kind of died out i think i pursued um, uh, music in Russia. So we lived in Russia for a little while and I was taught the piano by a very strict Russian lady teacher who would whack my knuckles <laughs> if I played, uh, you know, played it Stereotypical. Wrong. It was, I am not joking. And then you see a movie like Whiplash and I was like, hey, that's not That's my life. From the that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How old were you? I think I was close to maybe eight, nine. Yeah. Not that young. Eight, nine. So, and it was traumatic because she insisted on keeping like the door closed. So it was just, you know, the the, the sort of overall strong pedag- Russian pedagogical, I don't know, influence, whether if that, if that was it or not. And it was traumatizing. I think I, I began to hate playing the keyboard. It was... It was really something I didn't want to do. I would, I had a year for music in the sense that I could, you know, listen to tunes and replicate it. And I would do that for the longest time. So 10, 15 years go by. I'm in high school and, you know, yeah, okay, I'll get back to it. The class is here and there, very broken. And then college happens. And then there's this expansion and this explosion of freedom to, you know, do what you want in some sense. And I see this drum kit. And then that's where a lot of the magic for, for, for Black Earth also happened, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and I remember Subu was like, and I, we still, I still call him my drummer brother from another mother, right? <laughs> but like, I was v- very much in an exploratory uh, mindset, mind space, right? Yeah. And I remember sitting behind it, just being fascinated by it before I could even play a 4x4. Four four. It took me months to get... A four by I just could not believe how awkward the basic you know four four timing is where your dominant hand does one two three four your bass drum your kick goes on one your snare goes on three and it should feel like a beat instead of just you're just clunky on it you know yeah mm-hmm. and you know that's the beauty of just putting a a bunch of kids who don't know drumming and keep you know just putting a drum we didn't have any teachers right and we would just listen to the same kind of music metallica and yes. uh, we would just show up the next day to college and one of us would play and then we would say you know i think this is how it goes i think i figured it out <laughs> right so there's no teacher no one to, uh, and there's no real internet in the way i mean there was no real there was, there was no youtube so no video so it's pretty much you had a toy and we just figured it out ourselves and that was our uh, past time essentially more so you than me i think i was i was lagging in that sense but i think subu uh, was formative in that sense i think you were because not only did you teach me a few beats here and there but first of all the positive energy if you know people ever meet uh, uh, subu in real life they'll know what i'm talking about right the positive energy is one thing the the lack of barriers was another the and then you you started gifting me stuff. I mean, you you had that extra <laughs> pair of the Lars Ulrich signature sticks, which I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> and and then you had that that double pedal kick, double pedal, which I still right. have, by the way, it's in the cupboard right there. Yep. Can you imagine how old is that? It must be at least that, twenty-five years old now. Easily, because I got it. At the, it was a hand-me-down from another accomplished drummer. Her name was Durga, and I don't, I, yeah. I really don't know what she's doing right now, but. Yeah, it was a hand-me-down from other a drummer and then it came to you. I think you put the Iron Cobra beaters on it and you sold it to me for a nominal price. Yeah. Which, by the way, I had to like crowd ra- crowdfund it at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we made all the money back because we started winning competitions. So I, I landed up paying all the bad members awesome. back for that. It was crazy. Yeah. So I was just saying that, that, that the ultimate validation, I think, in terms of drumming skills, and I think the high point for me, just before you guys left, was you were late for practice or something. And we just had, you guys were, you know, doing Dream Theater's uh, Yitzi Jam at the time Mm -hmm. and I remember distinctly the one part where you decided to chop one 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 part of the bar because I think the band could just could not coordinate it and I remember it was a group call you guys made and decided to cut it and it irritated me to no end that you guys did that (laughs) so I made sure to play through it with you when you were late but it was like, yeah, yeah, well, this guy, yeah, replacement drummer. Replacement you know, drummer. Be like, you're, you're <laughs> almost, almost took my job. <laughs> you snooze, you lose. 
Yeah. Oh my god. That was so wait a minute. I want I want to go back to you casually just mentioned Russia. So what's the story there? How did you end up growing up there? Were you born there? I mean, if you no, if no, you no, were no. eight, that was probably just a freshly broken up Soviet Union at that point. Yeah. So this is crazy. So my parents actually studied in Ukraine and as life would have it, you know, they worked for companies that then eventually had like offices in 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 Russia and they were in the sort of retail and whatnot. So so I spent five and a half years there, 1989 to about 1995, around, around six years. And yeah, we saw the breakup of the USSR. Crazily, we lived on one of the main streets when... There was a siege on the White House. And so here, you know, it's like, again, maybe six, seven years old. Um, and my father was traveling at the time. So he was working for like an oil corporation. And so he was actually close to the North Pole, like really far away, buried in snow. And then there's the siege happening on the White House. And the tanks rolled down our street, Okay. So picture this. So it's like the middle of the night, an earthquake like sort of experience, right? Because the, the tracks really are very, very loud and they there's a lot of vibrations of the tanks on the road. And it's dark, it's dimly lit. And so my mom is obviously panicking and you know, we were like, What is going on? So you know, look outside the window and I see the tanks. And being the age I am, I'm like, yeah. Oh my god, this is so cool. Th- that's like the best <laughs> like, thing that could ever happen to you. <laughs> can you imagine using oh tanks to rolling? I'm like, wow, no concept of war, politics, nothing. And my mom, on the other hand, of course, was panicked. So we had to take shelter in the far side of the house, kind of hoping and praying that nothing would happen, desperately calling people, wondering what's going to happen. And and that's it. And I just remember being just fascinated as a kid by that. Just can you? So that dissonance and that kind of oil and water is sort of a mix of a, a child's, I don't know, innocence, if you want to call it that, overlaid in a deeply, deeply dark part of, of human history, you know, the fall out of the USSR and where things are today. It's just like, I can't believe that I was a part of those those experiences. It's blow, it blows my mind. It's pretty crazy. Going back to your music, you know, endeavors in life, uh, you have a pretty uh-huh. awesome project with your wife called What's the Scene? What's that yeah. all about? Fill us in. So, uh, as you know, and as I've said a few times, I am a scientist because I am a failed musician. <laughs> so, I moved to Mysore for my first job as an IT engineer. I land up in Mysore. I frequent Bangalore a lot. I meet a bunch of other people. We, st- I didn't start on the band, but I was playing with another band, with another friend. And we were doing gigs locally in Mysore and Bangalore and whatnot. And eventually, I landed up in Bangalore because I had malaria. <laughs> Some mosquito bit me <laughs> oh and I God. nearly died two times. Oh, my God. And because of that, I met my wife. So in our hmm. context, Cupid was a mosquito. Hmm. Okay, Literally. Like, it's the only reason we met. <laughs> oh because I had malaria. <laughs> and in Bangalore, she was, I think, fascinated by how fascinated I was with music and and really was into the scene and was trying to do all this and she couldn't believe that it was this hard and you know there are all these challenges access to equipment access to gigs there's no promotional framework nothing there's just no real representation and she is an accomplished well now she's a writer director actor playwright and super super sort of artistic has has a super artistic output but at that time, she was a uh, very, very avid writer. She used to blog like crazy and she won an All India Award and whatnot for like just being an incredible writer. Mm. So that's a whole new, <laughs> whole new uh, I think, podcast you'll have to do with her. <laughs> but eloquence, yeah, her eloquence, I think, really spilled over into the scene. And so by that, I mean, she wanted to get to the bottom of this and figure out what it was that really makes the scene tick. So we started off this sort of initiative as a newsletter within the company, right? We had a weekly release, we said, we're going to get a bunch of enthusiastic people to talk about the scene. What does that mean? It means we we have a gear enthusiast to talk about gear, you know, Hmm. what's the cutting edge, maybe make it advertisable, and you know, try and sink our teeth into some collaborations with, with import-export folks, you know, the music stores and whatnot. Or we can also talk about the latest albums that our favorite bands are releasing. And we could talk about bands locally and kind of put them on the same page. I mean, I mean that very literally. 
and say and so do these reviews and we wanted them to be objective we wanted them to be academic and really you know someone has to we have to we wanted to show that we were putting a lot of thought into the output of your average indian musician and and, and do the same for like an opeth or a dream theater mm-hmm. and and that's the kind that was our approach to kind of level the playing field okay from a listeners and a consumers standpoint yeah. so that was the newsletter now it suddenly it it snowballed it really grew into something like if we were late by a few hours not even a day right if we did not release it at 3 pm on a friday yeah people would email us where is this what's going on guys we were really excited about this i was like wow there is interest in this we did not think that this would happen so what started off as i think as a journalistic interest project for for priyanka primarily and for me as yeah you know i have the scene experience i'll be the cool consultant or whatever we sort of started this together and it really really picked up i mean by we ha- we we saw that it would be limited by being restricted to a bulletin board in the company and we decided to go outside we were like we're going to go to facebook the internet is exploding there's all these social media platforms this is crazy mm-hmm. and we did we and then we started you know in bangalore we were like okay, let's go attend a gig let's write about that gig let's photograph it let's put it up on the website put it up on the social media and see if people are interested in this it was yeah of course oh my god so we had a logo built there was a brand built around it we started the company you know just like like in like a small company at the time right whatever it's like a limited liability partnership mm-hmm. or a sole proprietorship or whatever and we started documenting the scene now word got around we started getting all access passes to all these venues and at that time it was burgeoning it was really something that was you know we had all these like kairas and b flats and it was like amazing to see the scene in bangalore why restrict to bangalore we are operating on a digital platform we can start you know if we communicate the value system and the and the the model and have a hub and spoke sort of approach across different cities we can have different teams so at one point we were operating out of 10 cities in the in that's the nice that is ridiculous yeah that's pretty that's real nice yeah. scaling <laughs> it so we became known as the the mirror of the scene if you want to call it that and you know people like veer das endorsed us 10 years ago who is this to me is crazy he may probably doesn't remember us today vidas is a, a fantastic indian comedian who is uh, based out of india and has an indian flavor to his comedy so to speak but has made it internationally he's and i think he was into this kind of music i hope he still is mm-hmm. and he had endorsed us way back then saying yeah what the scene is doing legit work we have photographers and reviewers in all these cities we have editors who coordinate all of this and you know get make sure that the content is delivered on time and delivered to the right place and you know we have fact checking and error checking and it was polished content that was out there yeah it's amazing so so is what the scene still active it is so as life would have it you know my wife and i oh, we were still just only dating and friends and then dating at the time and so it was a tumultuous ride through life and you know i moved abroad and it was difficult to kind of do things remotely and then even she moved here and so we we kind of went through a bit of a hiatus and i think it was for good measure because the scene changed on us i mean literally changed yeah, for the worse i would say i would think you know there's all these restrictions that exist right now the 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 way music is consumed in india has also changed mm-hmm. all those venues that had sort of supported the independent music scene i think evolved or devolved or closed down and so we went through i would say a bit of an identity i won't say crisis but a change and we kind of revamped the model in the last 3 4 years and we went again virtual but we have a much more focused approach where we have aggregated data aggregated reviews you know the the social media platform focus has changed but we are still essentially trying to do the same thing we're trying to and uh, now and not just sort of restricted to reviews and documenting the scene we want to connect and and allow musicians to kind of leverage our platform to to promote and collaborate and do stuff like uh that that and do and do things um, in a way that is representative of a well oiled uh, framework or structure the scene has no shape so to speak if you ask an average indian band or band member what does it take to succeed you're going to get a variety of answers now while diversity of thought and execution is great 
there isn't really any one clear path mm-hmm. so we are hoping that by doing what we do that we can help define that and crystallize that and really tap into the scene i mean we are a country of over a billion there are brilliant musicians oh, in yeah. our country and so there's all this talent that just does not get access yep. no and discovery so while we're trying yeah so the, so we were exactly so we want to be a discovery engine without being an online radio so mm. you see like it there's there's semantics and sort of nuances there that i think we are we're continuously figuring out and learning but what's the scene is just that it is we want to be the scene this is the scene it's our scene we are the scene yeah. in fact all the members you know we it, it almost became like a i won't say a cult but it was a great uh, sense of solidarity when we were the, the the broad older model it was we are the scene wts yeah. we are the scene what's the scene so there was a, a great sense of enthusiasm people did it out of passion did it, we didn't make any money off this in fact it sucks money like yeah. you know we we spent a lot of money on making sure the website uh, was was built from scratch we paid this designers we just went through a revamp pr- pr- process but the really nice thing is that we, the support that we've gotten from consumers other pillars in the industry and the bands and the musicians themselves you can't plan for this stuff i mean it's this amazing, is right? unbelievable yeah, it's the, yeah. it's the force think, you know, of what music- you do when you start a project we'll do this i know that the instagram handle is wts india for what's the scene india and That's for great. any additional links it'll be in the show notes so you should je- definitely check out all the what's the scene stuff there's some really good music and stuff on the indian music scene that is aw- awesome it's good for the bands it's good for diversity so we'll definitely have links to that stuff yeah so you know sidmo so thanks for joining us on this journey i mean educating us about the science that you work on talking to us about your personal life and it was it's obviously always fun digging into our past and making a record of it i think that's like that's one of the main reasons why we even started this podcast in a in a way it was for a selfish reason of making a record of all the fun that we have had in our, in our past right and i think that's uh, exactly what we did today So thanks for that and I hope listeners are also going to enjoy this episode we'll have links to all of the stuff that we spoke about in the part 1 of the science section and also all the indian music that we spoke about and that's it for this episode thank you